Hello and welcome to The Art of Grief, a series from the Completed Life podcast. Through conversations with artists, painters, writers, musicians, storytellers, and actors, we will hear how their craft, their books, paintings, songs, plays, and in today's case, exhibits, provided a path for them to connect with others as they pointed towards the common human experiences of loss and grief. Through their art, not only were they able to heal, but they were able to be a part of a healing process for others. My name is Lynn Barger Elliott, and I am the executive producer of Completed Life Podcasts. Our guest artist today is Paul Crawford, who lives in Penticton, British Columbia, where he has been the curator since 2008 for the Penticton Art Gallery. Over the years, Paul has read the culture of his community and discerned places where art can bring people together for conversations. Conversations that will lead to the health and well being of the community. When Canadian soldiers were serving in Afghanistan, he curated an exhibit of artists from Afghanistan and created educational opportunities for the community to learn more about the people and the culture of Afghanistan. In 2015, when the news feeds displayed devastating attacks in Syria, he curated an exhibit of Syrian artists and convened conversations with them so the community might better understand the history and the culture in Syria. This past year, Crawford had the sense that the families and friends of 50,000 people in Canada who have used made medical assistance in dying since it became legal in 2016, he had the sense that they might benefit from an opportunity to tell their stories. And so he sent out an open invitation across the provinces asking people to handwrite, to type, to email their stories and send them to Penticton Art Gallery, where they are currently on exhibit. By sharing and hearing the stories of others, it is Crawford's hope that Canadians might be able to safely ask questions and explore their feelings of grief and of loss. Welcome, Paul. We're so glad you could join us today. I'm thrilled to be here with you, and uh, thank you for your, your reaching out and for your interest and, and for all the work that you're doing as well. And uh, yeah, thrilled to have this conversation with you today. Thank you. And thank you for the, the generous uh, introduction as well. You're very welcome. I think you've earned that. <laughs> Some people see the enjoyment of art as a private or individual pleasure. They might purchase a piece and take it home, put it on their living room wall and enjoy it in the privacy of their own home. But that doesn't sound like your philosophy. You, you seem to have the instinct to bring people together through and around art. Where does that instinct come from? I, I had some great teachers through elementary school that sort of taught me that art um, wasn't just an object. I, I always look at art as social history rather than art, you know, theoretical history and things like that. It's certainly, I see objects as bookmarks in time that tell a story and their value is sort of inextricably wrapped around the individual who created it, the time it was which it was um, created, uh, the, in, the circumstances that would have maybe influenced it. And, and sort of that, and it's sort of that bookmark, like a 1920s Picasso is very much different than a 1970s Picasso. You know, they're um, they're very different things. And so, um, and and as I've been sort of growing up in my life and things like that, um, I realize that you know it's it's a one thing that seems to always get cut first when it comes to classes and stuff, and it always intrigued me as to to why that is. But I I guess. The answer that I've come up with is that, that art is a powerful thing. You know, when you, you know, when when the Allies uh, regained control of Europe after World War II, what was the thing they found in all the salt mines? 
you know, when a company, when a country invades another one, the first thing they do is steal all the art, try to destroy the culture. You know, that's a, a very powerful thing. You know, sports are great for nation building and for that, that sense of things, but art is a much deeper, richer thing. And, and certainly like music, there isn't a, there isn't a, a human alive on the planet, whether you're a monk in a mountain, uh, all by yourself that spent the last 50 years of your life alone that does not have a musical soundtrack to their lives, you know, and, uh, you know, when when we're all at our lowest point, we're not reaching for the greatest, latest piece of legislation that your local town council passed on the dog bylaw or something like that. You're reaching for a piece of music or a book or something that can either, you know, raise you up to your highest highs or tear you down into, you know, and into, you know, and, and emotionally and everything else. And so art for me has always been something that's been really remarkable and I've always been really um deeply aware of, you know, at least in my later life, um, in my twenties and stuff, became int really aware of the power of art and the importance of art and culture and in our lives. And um, in my role here at the gallery, I, I think it's really important to, not all our shows, but I think it's important to provide a platform for these discussions. And so, you know, the Made in Canada exhibition is just one of those examples of, of providing a space and, to, and trusting the process and, hoping that through it all um, something positive will come out of it, you know, and uh, I'll be honest, the three shows I have on now are sort of dealing with mental health and the MAID program was something I've been thinking about for a long time, but uh, was really prompted by the potentiality that was there uh, that uh, mental health as a sole underlying uh, condition would have been legalized under the made in, uh, mental, uh, medical assistance and dying program. And that would have taken, that would have come into law, uh, was supposed to have come into law like a week before our exhibition opened. And so looking at the fact that we were doing a mental health show, uh, looking at a friend of mine that went through the made program last year, sort of got around the system, but largely due to mental health, uh, reasons, um, really sort of prompted me wanting to, to bring this part of the conversation to it all. And that the, the Canadian government, um, delayed the the inclusion of mental health as a sole underlying uh, factor into the MAID program for another two years or three years, I think it is. Uh, so it sort of came off the table, but I'd already sort of got into it. And so, um, yeah, and, and it opened up a whole bunch of conversations that I, I guess I had thought about, but hadn't really considered. And we have uh, on our board, we have uh, um uh, I'm a disability activist and, and, and she is very active in the community. And um, that was my first real hurdle was sort of uh, bringing it up to her and sort of having a, and I having a, imposing upon her what I thought her, her view on this would be. Mm -hmm. And then um, a nice way to she, say that. Yeah. And, uh, it's an and honest she, way to say that. <laughs> yeah. And I, like, I, I thought, you know, I thought she was all pro made, you know, like from things that she had said mm -hmm. and looking at her Facebook postings. And, and so I, I, you know, I, I enthusiastically said, Hey, I want to take this on and would love to engage you as part, you know, as part of this project. And, um, but it became very quickly apparent that she didn't share that view. And suddenly looking at all the challenges faced by the disability community and, and the medical assistance dying program. And, um, and I got paralyzed. Like I just got inundated by stories that she would send me and arguments against why maid shouldn't be, um, you know, why it shouldn't be expanded for mental health or disabilities, people with disabilities. And, um, and I understand all those concerns now, like, but it paralyzed me. Like I, you know, I, I came down, I, I got stuck with the whole thing, you know, I guess the, the do no harm, you know, the, like the, the, the whole thing. And so that really was an interesting process to go through that because, um, like I, you know, I, for me, it's always about just, I get an idea and I just go with it. And, uh, and it's usually easier that way. And things generally tend to work out better. Um, but this was an interesting one because I never actually, uh, had that sort of pushback. And it wasn't that she was pushing back, uh, but she had great concerns after ha in initially being very enthusiastic about the exhibition as we had conversations. I, maybe she had an opinion that I was, uh, pushing an agenda, uh, that maybe didn't align with hers. Um, and I tried to explain to her, you know, I'm not pro-made, I'm not anti-made. Um, I'm open to all ends of it. And I'm also under, appreciate the fact that everybody's view on this subject will change as their life circumstances change or the circumstances of the people around them change. Um, 
And so I didn't want to come into it with any preconceived notions or an agenda or an opinion. I wanted to just be open to hearing all the sides of the story and creating a, a, a safe space where we could express our feelings on this. And, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, I've, I've known 20 people, I think, um, that have gone through the made program here in the last three years. Like it's shocking. And, you know, here in Canada, over 60,000 people since 2016 have gone through the made program. My, the, probably the closest, um, thing that really prompted my wanting to get into this whole conversation was last summer. Um, I had a friend of mine, uh, more of a friend of my wife's, but a friend of mine as well, um, who had suffered from mental health for, for many, many years. And, uh, about a year ago, about this time last year, she had written to my, she had emailed my wife and she had said, um, I want to apply for the MAID program. Um, and I want you to endorse my application, which was really an interesting thing. So we hadn't really been there and, you know, she's in her forties. She was like 40, 46. And, uh, and she was quite clear that it was struggling with the mental health. The mental health was the predominant driving factor that she couldn't, she couldn't continue, imagine a life continuing on to the quality of life that she was living with the mental health that she, issues that she constantly had. And no, ma no matter how much, there wasn't enough resources in our local medical system in terms of psychiatry and everything else to, to give her the resources that she needed. And every time that she got the resources or something happened, inevitably it seemed to go sideways very quickly. Like it would be a great thing. And, and so it was, you know, she was very clear that that was what the reason was. And then she got denied originally because under the Canadian law at that time, mental health was not a, an underlying factor that you could go through made. And so about two months later, um, we got an email back from her and she, or she didn't She She went for lunch with my wife and she's like, I got accepted to the maid program and, um, and we've set a date and this is the date. And I'm like, and we're like, Whoa, how, how did you get, how did that happen? You know, like, um, but she had, I guess, uh, a congenitive arthritic condition that at some point in her life would have been debilitating and would have greatly impacted her life. You know, did it cause her discomfort now? Potentially. Um, I, I don't know, but that was what she was able to get in on the May program with. And so, um, so anyhow, it was really an interesting process to go through that with her and then, you know, getting up to the day and watching her for the first time in her life, sort of taking real control of her life and having the power to know that she is in control of her out, the outcome. And, uh, it was a really intriguing thing to watch um but you know you, in your mind you're thinking okay this isn't going to continue on like this right and um and then she invited friends and family some from new york actually came out for a final weekend celebration and and dinner and being you know that mental health is the thing she was like on a high she was on one of those highs that night and we said good night and the next day we all met she had it was sort of like theater. She had, she had really planned everything out. She was a yoga teacher. And so she had arranged, um, to have the, 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 the whole thing take place in a funeral home. I uh, had allowed everybody to sort of get into meditative poses, made a soundtrack. And, and so, you know, through it all, the things that really sort of resonated with me at the end of it all was, was, you know, in one way, I'm grateful that she had that moment and, and um, she was able to take control of things. Um, and it kind of reminded me of a documentary I saw years ago called The Bridge about San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, and people mm -hmm. who commit suicide on that. And, and in watching that documentary, it seemed to me that the people that wanted to commit suicide, once they went over the railing, it was, they were gone. Like they were, but then there were the people that would inevitably go over and hold on for dear life, hoping that someone would pull them back. Some mm -hmm. of those people would fall off. And... But what I really got out of that was, and, and what I got from Carrie sort of, which really sort of brought that back into my mind was like, she was truly for the first time in my life in absolute control of what was going to happen. And, um, and I think that brought her great comfort. And it's interesting in talking to other people since this show has been up who have signed up for made for whatever conditions or, or things 
are that are sort of in a holding pattern. They haven't set a date, but are there. It has extended their life and quality of life, knowing that they at any time have that option to take control of their destiny. And I think uh, being accepted in there into that program and knowing that you have an out has also allowed them the ability to release and let go of themselves. And uh, so it, it's a fun, it's a, it's an interesting thing. I, and I've been really moved and touched and brought to tears with the stories of people that have confided in me about, you know, their own, uh, you know, having that, having that, that get out of jail card in their wallet, you know, that they mm -hmm. could cash in and, and the reasoning why they do it. And, you know, even with the great objections from families and stuff, we're not even telling their family that this is what their wishes are, you know, for fear of shame and stuff. And um, it is, it's a very complicated, nuanced subject. And I don't think there are any right answers, you know, um, everybody has an opinion. And as I said, I think everybody's opinion and view on the subject will change as their own life circumstances change. And, uh, and I think we just we don't deal with death in general very well in our society here. Um, so I think that's probably a good place to start. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's been remarkable as an exhibition. It hasn't. I think part of the problem. Like I, I would love to see this continue, the exhibition and everything that we had here. Um, I wanted to serve as a as a time capsule. In the literature that you wrote about the exhibit, and it's called Made in. Canada, you said that it was in direct response to your own experiences uh, with MAID over the years. And as you tell it, there's been um, some issues that are unresolved or some questions that you have. Uh, as you collected stories as they were sent into you, did you, was that reflected in the uh, voices that you heard across the country? Yeah, you know the the concerns that I, I, you know, most of the most of the people that have submitted the things to me have been um, on the pro end of things. Like I did a whole show here in 2017 about the culture of cannabis because Canada was at that time looking at um, at legalizing cannabis, and so uh, so I got ahead of the curve and we did a show about that. But it was very difficult to find anti-cannabis activist art you know it was sort of people could say it was really slanted in one direction well i, I tried my best and there wasn't really a, a whole lot of people on the other end of the equation that wanted to step up to it yeah. and so the conversations that i've been having with people sort of revolve around those but for the people that have signed up to made and in my own sort of trying to understand as to you know why you would why is this something that you would want and and a lot of the people who i've had the conversations with are not unlike my friend carrie they're at this point in their lives are healthy. Some are elderly. Um, some of them are young. One um, gentleman that phoned me up um, was dealing with uh, identity issues, gender and identity, and, and uh, mental health was a large part of that conversation. And um, they, you know, they, and I don't know what, how they got around the system too, because they're, they, they've got their, they've been approved for the main program. And, uh, but they said to me, they said, uh, you know, having that approval has bought me three years of life and been the best three mm -hmm. years of my life. If the government changes the legislation, I'll go and I'll, I'll go and take, I'll do the MAID program tomorrow. Hmm. But in the interim, knowing that I have that out has taken a huge burden off my, my daily existence and allowed me to live a much more holy, whole and complete life um that's a powerful thing like i can't yeah. i can't argue that you know right. um and so who am i to be that judge whether that is the right decision or not you know like um they at the end of their lives in their 30s they do have the right of self-determination and the right of free will to decide what they want to do and even though that they said that their family and their friends are all vehemently opposed to this on more on religious and moral grounds and all that um they're steadfast in their in their determination they want to do it another woman i talked to um and again i don't know what her underlying health issue is but she seemed pretty healthy 
you know, she's a volunteer here at the gallery and she's like, yeah, you know, I've signed, it's sort of like having a do not resuscitate order, I suppose. But she says, yeah, I signed up for it. Um, I don't want to do it tomorrow. I might not want to do it next month, but I've been accepted into the program for whatever reason it is. And until that time, I'm going to live the best possible life that I have. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I can appreciate that part. Yeah, of it. Sure. Um, and yeah, like, uh, you know, and who am I to, to tell that individual that they have, they don't have the right to do it or not. I, you know, um, yeah, that's part of the whole thing yeah. that I'm trying to discover with this process, you know, and, and the more I talk to people and the, you know, and especially those people that are truly at the end of their lives, um, you know, who, who, uh, who go through the program, it is, you know, it, it's a great relief to everybody. And you know what? We could all be so blessed in our lives to be able to tie up all the loose mm -hmm. ends, you know, and say the things we need to say and take some sort of control over things. Like, I, I think that's, there is a certain yeah. beauty and a power to that, you know, and if I ever find myself in that situation, I think I'll just at the last minute just sort of say, oh, I forgot about the key to the safe deposit <laughs> box is left. Then, oh, right. <laughs> you know, you know, leave people so wondering. When, leave, yeah. Right. So when you imagined or were developing the idea for this uh, exhibit, you were thinking about uh those loved ones, the family and friends of uh, those who had used MAID, and you uh, extended an invitation to people to uh, handwrite, to typewrite, to email a letter to be displayed at the gallery as part of the exhibit. What kind of response have you received? Um, well, this is one of those funny things. The reason I asked for the handwritten letter was I wanted the human element to it, right? I wanted, I wanted, because everybody, you know, chat GPT, if, if you were, if you had a certain viewpoint that you wanted to, to get across, you could just pump out as a million letters through chat GPT that would certainly bolster your, your, your view on this pro negative or indifferent. <clears throat> and so I, I really wanted just that human element to it, that this is actually a letter by a real person who's taken the time and the thought to do it. Um, that, that, but funnily enough, there's always going to be somebody who's going to challenge that. And, and I hadn't even thought about it again. Back to the, the, the quadriplegic that I, the person mm -hmm. that I spoke to, I can't write it. I'm like, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. You know, like it hadn't even occurred to me that, of course, there's a very, there's a, a large bunch of the population that might have a valuable thing to add to this conversation that might not be physically able to write a letter, you know, hand write a letter through whatever thing, whether you're elderly, maybe you got a bad arthritis or, and so, so then I'm like, okay, you can send me an email. Um, and, and so it did open it up. Did anybody typewrite a letter? Oh, we didn't. No, no, I don't have any typewritten ones. Uh, uh, no, just emails and, uh, and handwritten ones. If, if I could do it again, I, you know, I, like I said, the, my one board member uh, really paralyzed me. Um, so with this show, uh, one of the other shows I have was on mental health as well. And, and that became an overwhelming thing too. Cause I had an, another guest curator that I was working with on that show. And, um, and so it became a lot to take on, you know, like it was this perfect storm. We have a festival that was running concurrent as well. So I had too many balls in the air and just that idea of do no harm really started to bog me down. And I, and I, um, I would love to re I would love to revisit this exhibition or I would love somebody else to revisit this and really give it the runway that it needs to lead up to really flesh out or get the word out to get people's opinions in it. And, uh, and yeah, and it's so funny because yeah, just this board member, they were giving me one perspective and they were saying, well, you can't go to this organization. You can't get this one because they're, they're pushing an agenda. And I just, like I said, I, this and amongst everything else that was going on at the time just totally paralyzed me. And I just, I went, you know, and it, I wish I had, um, I'd love to take that time back to reach out to all those things, you know, no really, you know, not have gotten bogged but down so much by her fearing that I was trying to push an agenda when really I was just trying to have a conversation and you got to have all ends of it. You know, like, I don't care if you are a super right, uh, evangelical Christian, pro-life, 
organization that says this is the worst thing you could possibly do, I would love to hear your opinion. I'd love to understand why that is. Or if you're the totally liberal, let's, you know, everybody has a right to do whatever they want, no matter what your age is. Like if you want to die tomorrow, perfect. We can sign you up and do this. I'd love to understand what your thinking is of that as well. Right. And I'd love to hear of the people that are left behind that are in between this whole thing that are left wondering what, how this is going on, you know, like, what is this all about? You know? Um, so I kind of feel like I kind of missed a little bit out on the broadness of the conversation because I got caught up too much in not wanting to, as I said, do no harm. You know, that was the part of it, but what's come out of it has been remarkable and incredibly touching, wonderfully moving, uh, enriching and, and emotionally draining and uplifting at the same time. Like it's, it has only deepened my desire to explore this in greater detail or hand it off to somebody else to try to create, um, you know, if this can be a catalyst for another exhibition somewhere else, you know, I don't necessarily need to do it myself. And I'm sure there's lots of people who could do it far better than I could. Um, but I do think it's an important conversation. And I think it's much deeper than just the right to die or not to die. I think it really looks at society and our values and our understanding and our uh, acceptance of death and end of life in general, but just our own sense of connection and community. And, you know, could some of these problems, some of the concerns that people have be solved if we just had a much more connected, compassionate and empathetic society in general? Like, like how do we, how do we just become more compassionate? Compare, caring and understanding and um did that did you get a sense that people walked away with that question when they read the stories that were collected i think so you know it's been interesting because i i so basically i i i had a wall of remembrance because I, I went to bernie man a number of years ago and going to the temple and seeing all the photos and the stories that was really quite moving to to see that and the powerful impact of that I, so I tried to put that up here and I haven't had much uptake on that, but, but everything else was put into binders and uh, on tables facing the wall. And uh, I just wanted people to be able to have moments of quiet self-reflection to, to read through the letters, read through um, the news articles around it, uh, understand the history of it. If you want to know what the made process application form is, here it is. Look at, look at it for yourself. You want to know, what the drugs are well here's a video that'll go through step by step the process of what happens to the person that is undergoing made you know so i i tried to find videos and 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 articles and stories that gave as much as a complete uh view of the stories i possibly could to try to answer off any questions but also hopefully encourage people to to go on their own journey of self-discovery or you know, challenge what notions you may have otherwise. And so it has been really interesting. Um, and because you're facing the wall, everyone's behind you. If you're listening to the video, you got the headset on. And so you can sort of tune out everything else and you can sort of get lost in it. And then, you know, I don't feel comfortable when I go down there, if I see somebody engaging it, unless they want to reach out and share a story or a thought or something else. Um, I've been very reluctant to sort of interject myself into that moment with those individuals, but it's been great to, to engage those people that have sort of reached out um, to me after the fact or as a result of it and, and sort of have that sort of, sort of debrief and get a, an understanding of where they were, when they came in, where they are upon leaving and if something has shifted or not. And, like I said, there's no wrong answers. Have it, have your your view, um, one way or the other. Like I'm not I'm not here to judge you on how you how you view this. So it's um, yeah. I I, th I think at the end of the day, at the heart of it all, I think everybody just wants the best interest of those that you care and love, you know, and and want to be compassionate. Um, I think we have a fascination of hanging on to people hanging on to life far beyond their expiry date uh, for fear of letting go or giving up. 
at great personal um, detriment, you know, just because you loved grandma doesn't mean that grandma needs to, you know, be resuscitated for the sixth time from a heart attack and left on a life support system that really is no quality of life, you know, just because you don't want to let go of her. Um, we need, I think at the core of it all, we just need to sort of be able to let go and be, be good that there is this transition and what lies beyond none of us will know until we get there. Were there themes that you were able to pick up in people's letters or responses to you, things that they submitted? You know, I wish, you know, I, I haven't really thought about that. I, the, I think for the people that were sort of pro, the, the, the main thing was just coming to terms with the, with the, with the life that uh, the person that they let go. Um, and the beauty in that moment of, you know, I, I think a completed life. There you go. I think that's it. You know, be able to put a full stop on the end of it in terms that are, that you have control over. And, uh, and, you know, maybe there, there's, there'll always be things that are left unsaid. There'll always be emotions that are, you know, and chapters that are left unread or incomplete, but, um, if you're if you're if you're getting to that point in your life, this is you know something that I I think is kind of a compassionate um, way for someone to exit gracefully, but also for all those around that individual to maybe try to come to um, come to you know the resolution of a life well lived, you mm -hmm. know and. Um, yeah, I, I think for those people that, and and these are most of pe mostly from the people that have had people who are like terminal. Um, I think they they felt that the general consensus is once you get past the shock of it and you go through it, there is a beauty to it and a certain sense of peace that you can go to bed with. Um, so uh, storytelling. Uh, is considered an art, an art form. From your perspective, how was this? Uh, how are these conversations different than, say, like a book discussion or um, people coming together to uh, talk about a presentation I made? How was hearing people's stories? Uh, different how did that impact your audiences differently than uh maybe like a documentary or something a uh, academic study of made would have well i think when you're looking someone in the eye and you can actually connect with them and in the flesh and sort of have this conversation and be able to ask them the questions that you know You'd be, you'd be it'd be nuts to think that you wouldn't have questions of course you know uh, it, it's it's pretty impactful and so i think for a lot of people to see somebody there talking about the their loved one that had passed away had gone through made or somebody that has signed up for made and these are the reasons why why they've chosen to do so are pretty powerful and moving and compelling things and it's somewhat difficult to to challenge them on it at all you can challenge them like as to to why but to make a moral judgment on them i think is really i don't know if that's our place to do that but i think it's great to have that conversation and if you should be challenging anybody's moral judgment maybe it should be your own you know like holding a mirror up to yourself as to why do i feel this or why do I judge you for making that decision? You know, um, rather than listening to their to their life story, and I, stories are everything. Like that's the one thing made is it is a, all about the stories. And you know, I think most people that have given it some time haven't certainly. If you came in anti made, I don't think it. The exhibition has in any way enhanced their sense of being anti-made. If you came in very pro-made, I don't think it has in any way made you um, 
that much stronger of an advocate for Maine. I think the people that have spent the time to read the letters have probably ended up ending up being a little bit more compassionate to each individual story and circumstances. And if they reflect, do any self-reflection on their own life experience and the people around them, maybe a little more understanding as to why people may make those decisions. And maybe in some way, um, if faced with that decision of by a loved one, becoming a little bit more compassionate and understanding and empathetic as to why the decisions that they are making it and not making it so much about your own needs, but respecting their needs. Beautiful. Uh, In your opinion, what role can art or art museums or galleries serve as society wrestles with issues like made? Well, I think the arts and galleries are like a, a mirror by which we can, you know, hold up to ourselves to reflect our society. And I think uh, the health of a society is reflected in the art of that society, the culture that that society creates and produces and has. And I, I honestly, I, I feel that the arts are the one vehicle that we can delve into these subjects and topics and things and and should be there, right? That's the whole thing about it, the arts are there to stimulate conversations and evoke emotional responses um, and take us on a journey, you know, uh, to dark places, to light places, to highs and to lows, to our deepest pain and our high, you know, our greatest jubilation. And I think uh, I, I feel, I fear that a lot of the art that is produced today is has been usurped to placate us to pacify us to uh entertain us in ways that is really superficial and i i hope that exhibition and get more galleries and more artists will be willing to sort of get back into sort of being those cultural provocateurs where they're engaging us to examine the world around us and our place within the world and you know for better or for worse you know like to to really sort of look at things in a in a in a starker light and i i i fear that the sort of the the culture in which we have we're we're existing in right now um makes it really challenging for artists to take on subjects that are maybe a bit more controversial or challenging and things like that I think that's the thing. That's the scary part of art is that it is so universally trans. It, it, it it is something that everybody can access and everybody can connect to. And it doesn't matter if you know the language or you understand what that blob on a canvas is. Like we did a show here years ago of this artist, Agnes Martin, and she was, she was born in Canada, gained great fame down in Taos, New Mexico and in New York in the 1950s. But in t- her entire mature painting career was canvases that were all the same size, or five foot by five foot, all horizontal lines. And um, and so I did a show of her work here because I was intrigued by that, you know. And the show I couldn't afford her canvases, so we did a, a show of thirty prints, and uh, th- so thirty, and they're all twelve inches square, and they were very pale. And I had one wall in our main gallery with it. I had a documentary on one side photocopies of notes that she had given from a lecture and then these 30 things that at the end of the day he took up maybe you know maybe 20 feet by 10 feet on the wall from 20 feet away it was just like a bunch of brown frames you couldn't even tell what was in there but the thing that amazed me was once you put people in there and you allowed them that opportunity to go up and just spend some time with it is how many people would come out just shocked you know like for like, and it was interesting. It was mostly women would have this experience, but I'd, I'd come out and people would be all red eyed and teary and, and they would be standing in front of this thing. And maybe it was hearing her life story on the video behind them, but standing that moment of quiet con- um, self reflection in front of these 30, 12 inch square drawings of horizontal lines of various thicknesses and hues and everything else, uh, but pretty much monochromatic and very much very subtly painted of that just inexplicably being 
I'm in this emotional cathartic moment where just like something welled up deep inside you that you couldn't explain or understand or even fathom or even knew that existed within inside of you could just sort of come forth like that as a tsunami of this emotional sort of purging in front while you're looking at something that for most intensive purposes, you would never give the time of day. It's like looking at a piece of full scat paper. That's essentially mm -hmm. what it would be look, like, looking at. And, uh, and it's just incredible that, that, that something like that could have the power to bring out in somebody, um, such a, a flood of an emotional response that, how do you think that happened? But I don't know. That's a magic. That's a beauty, right? Like, I don't want to know how that happens, you know, like, and not all art will affect all people the same way. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Like there are no wrong answers at art either. You like it or you don't, you know, just be open to the experience and, and see where it might take you. You know, that's the thing. Like, I think we've done this incredible job in this industry of the art, visual arts and it, I'm sort of creating this separation between us and them. Like you need the special power or understanding or knowledge or this key to the kingdom to understand why, you know, 12 lines on a piece of paper is of significance. Yeah, I agree. At the Completed Life Initiative, we believe that when we can comfortably talk about our death, uh, we get better at talking about and knowing how we want to live in a more purposeful and meaningful way. So through sharing the sharing of the stories of those who were impacted by MADE, what lessons could you see people taking away about how to live? I think we all carry a lot about us that we'd love to let go. And, you know, and sometimes just saying it is one of those things or just acknowledging that it existed, you know, um, I think we we live in a, a society that is really shame based. Like I think shame and guilt and everything else is a powerful tool, and I think it's something that hinders our personal growth and our ability to to be to be our fullest selves. And I just yeah, just I hadn't even thought about this until you brought it up. But if I think about the people that I did, I think the greatest disrespect I did to or disservice I did to myself and in times of coming to terms with it, if, if I didn't, if I, if I had challenges and maybe to them was, you know, not trusting that they would be willing to engage in some of those conversations that were always left unsaid that were sort of lurked in the shadows, but we never really got into, you know, or, you know, I look at, I look at my father, he didn't die for maid, but I just think about that, you know, like how many of us have sort of, unresolved ghosts that sort of hang over our lives of in our relations to the people and and there was something about made is that you know when it's good you know you know when it's going to be over so you better get cracking and if you if, if the person that you're with is in the capacity that they can share their stories and they've entrusted you to bring you into this circle um maybe not be so worried about you know, I guess it's all about being respectful. And you know, of course, you don't want to attack somebody or, or whatever. But I, I think if it's somebody that really matters and cares to you, then you should be able to. I think that would all help us a lot to try to let go of those things, you know, um, or find those answers to those things that we always wanted to know. And yeah. uh, um, maybe, maybe for better or for worse, I don't know. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> we maybe left thinking at all, but you know, like I was adopted as well, and and um, and I found my birth parents later in life, and uh, and I always thought, you know, it worked out well. We all got along and all that, but you know, even if it had turned out poorly, at least then I would have I would have never been left wondering, you know, like what they were like or if they cared or anything, right? And um. And I do think in, in passing, a large part of our problem is all the unknown, unresolved things that we have that hold us back, you know, in our own lives, you know, or maybe don't allow us to celebrate or honor or let go of the person that we need to let go of. You know, it's, you know, it's grief is never an easy thing and we don't do well with it. And I'm sure when I'm confronted with it, in the next, in the next time, in a real, when impactful way, 
I hope I'll be in a position that I can deal with it admirably and and well. Then I, you know, I haven't um, I haven't found myself in a situation where I've you know had my whole world fall out from underneath of me. Knock on wood, but eventually I will find myself in that situation, and we all will. And I hope a that we have a good community to support us as we go through that. But I also hope that we also are able to sort of through our life experiences sort of realize that, you know, find a way to deal with grief in general is a better thing and not be shamed by, by grief and, um, and better to cope, deal with people that are going through grief, you know, like, like everybody's going to grieve differently and some people want interaction. Some people don't want any, but, but people still, I think want to know that, that you're present, you know, that there's, that there is someone there, whether it's just phoning them up and not talking to you, but just hearing someone breathing out of the other end of the phone, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, but I do feel that I, I, I feel we need to be a much more connected uh, meaningfully connected community. And and that's not thinking that a Facebook friend is being a connection or liking someone's like. It's about actually connecting with people in a, in a tangible, meaningful way. And, and I think the MAID program is one way of opening the door to that greater sense of connection um, in yeah. some way. So, yeah, whether you, whether you agree with it or not, um, it's not about you again. It's about the person there and you have the choice to engage or not engage in that process. Um, and both options that you choose are going to have impacts on your life moving forward. Yeah, And That's you good. need to make that decision of what's the cost of the stance that you make and what are you willing to, to live with as a result of that, that decision you make. You had hopes and goals for this exhibit. And I know there's so much more that you talked about that you could have done, but overall, do you think you met your goals? Um, I do. I, I, you know, at the end of the day, if I have any, if I have any disappointment, my disappointment was the fact that I, uh, you know, of course, you always hope things could be bigger and greater and and deeper. The fact that I'm sitting here with you right now is a victory in so many ways. You know, I would have never had the opportunity to to meet you otherwise. I've thoroughly enjoyed learning about you and and the project you worked with and having this conversation with you today. And um, I think I've been pretty long winded and I apologize for that. But uh, but I, I you know in every and only wisdom. Only wisdom. Well in every in every way it's been a victory. And the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, if only one person came and saw the show and walked away with an aha moment or a greater sense of inner peace or understanding or what have you, whatever, whatever they came away with. And that's a victory in itself. You know, I know people are arguing, Oh, you're normalizing this and all that other stuff. And it's like, well, it is a fact of our society. 60,000 people in Canada have normalized it long before I took this topic on. Um, so um, we need to accept that it exists and we need to be able to talk about it and we need to be able to not pass uh, judgment on those that choose to, this is their option. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I, th I think there's way, there's, there's, it's a very deep well this is and mm. uh, there'll never be a definitive answer uh, to it, but I think there's lots of incredible conversations that are yet to be had. Um, lots of incredible opportunities for public engagement and deep, meaningful um, insights that can come out of this process. And I think the work that you're doing and your podcast is providing space for some of these conversations. And uh, and yeah, I th I think I think there's so much. I think we're just even though there's 60,000 people here in Canada that have gone through the MAID program, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of our full understanding of the social implications that this is going to have on our society 
and um, and um, it'll be interesting to see how that all that all plays out as time goes on and and how we evolve to deal with this reality that exists and uh, and what we can do to try to make it um, less stigmatized um, and yeah how can we how how can we I don't know I don't know it'll be, it'll be really interesting just to sort of see see how it all works out well I want to thank you for this conversation but also for the effort that you've put into to creating conversations in your own community and in your across your own country I think it's invaluable and uh, I suspect it's the tip of the iceberg as well just beginning to create vehicles and tools to begin those reflections and to allow people to uh, come out of their isolation and solitude and to be able to have their stories heard. It's very powerful. And uh, I think uh, I, for one, am grateful and I know I'm confident others are as well. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm on honored to be able to, to do the work that I do, to have the platform that I do have and, as long as I have it, I, I hope I will use it for, you know, providing space for conversations such as this. And uh, and I and like I said, if, if there's another opportunity to to expand upon this with you, and or if you think of other things and you think we can in some way we can contribute to that, I would be honored to to sit down and have those conversations and be part of something that expands beyond this. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Yeah, we would be too. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Art of Grief with Paul Crawford, curator of the Penticton Gallery in Penticton, British Columbia. To learn more about this exhibit and others mentioned in this interview, we encourage you to visit the gallery's website at pentictonartgallery.com. That's P-E-N-T-I-C-T-O-N artgallery.com. And thank you to Jed Olbaum, the sound editor for The Art of Grief, a Completed Life podcast. Other episodes from this series include an interview with author and writing coach Cynthia Clark, pianist, composer, and visual artist Adam Tendler, harpist, chaplain, and music thanatologist Catherine DeLong, journalist and author Greg Melville, and international creative events designer Samuel Sangwa. You can find these episodes as well as other Completed Life podcasts on our website, completedlife.org, or by going to the Completed Life Initiative YouTube channel. We love to hear from our listeners. If you have a story to share or would like to respond to this episode by telling us about a way art has helped you navigate your grief, please email us at info at completedlife.org. Thank you again for joining us today.